Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's show, I meet a painter, mixed media artist. It's an artist here in Madison and fascinated by the person's work. I love it. And I even mention in the show, I'm like, this was the type of artwork that I aspired to do when I first started out, like way back in high school, but I just could not pull it off. So I'm in awe of what this person creates. And I'm just really excited that I got to talk to them on the show today. It's a great conversation. We find out about the fantastic journey the person took that led them here to Madison, not originally from Madison. So we get into that. So check out this week's episode. Of course, you're checking out this week's episode. You're listening to it right now. But before I go into it, don't forget to check out my website. Maybe that's what I meant to say. Go to my website, tomraiswebsite.com. If you're hearing this show for the first time, you can check out my daily vlog and the things that I sell there and all the other podcasts. I added a feature now where you can filter by the type of art that is on the podcast that I've put out. But I would recommend listening to all of them because even though I'm a cartoonist, I've learned so much from talking to writers, painters, sculptors, people that do things that I'm not able to do, that I haven't done, but we're all trying to achieve the same thing. So every one of their stories can kind of open up an idea of things that you could do in a realm that you don't work in, but you could apply it to your own. Anyway, that's why I love this show, learning these things. And again, this is a great artist and a great conversation. So check this out on Tom Ray's Art Podcast starting right now. My name is Angelica Contreras. I'm a visual artist. I specialize in mixed media painting. So you're here in Madison um, and you haven't been here. You, you aren't from Madison. You moved to Madison. So why did you move here? Uh, I was born in Whittier, California. But at some point when I was still young, I moved to um, Guadalajara, Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, I grew up basically in Mexico. And I moved... I've been in Madison for about five years, a little bit over five years. I've lost track now. <laughs> <laughs> and my boy, I met my boyfriend in Guadalajara. He taught at an international school, which I was also, I also worked there. So, yeah, we're here. And you we're guys, back. you guys just, or is he from here or is? Yes, he's from Eau Claire. Okay. But his parents live in Madison, so. We just stayed in Madison. Okay, gotcha. So I'm always curious as to why people come here. I'm one of those people who, growing up, I was always like, I'm going to get out of here. And clearly, here I am. So <laughs> I'm always curious to see why people come here. And yeah. That's So you guys met uh, at a... at a uh, International school. International school. So what is that? Yeah. So there are some... Inter look, there's international schools all over. Uh -huh. And uh, these schools are... A lot of the kids that are from the consulates, because they're like bilingual schools, uh, they send their their children there. So that means they the schools need to hire foreign teachers. There's a lot of teachers from the U.S., Canada, and other parts of the world, and um, they're private schools. A lot of of the big cities have at least one international school. So when you say from the consulate, are you saying like there are representatives from other countries? Like, are you saying the, the type of thing that it's in movies where it's like there's the U.S. embassy? And yeah. And okay. yeah. So so the consulates or the embassies uh, send their usually tend to send their 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 kids to these international. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Uh, wow. How did you get involved in that? So I, I was in the language department, so this particular school uh, had a language uh, department, so parents could learn English and other languages, and also the students could learn other languages after school. Okay. So, yeah. And that must have helped when you came back here, because you're working with the school system right now in, in Madison. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm a, what they call a BRS. I'm an interpreter translator. I'm a bilingual resource specialist. Oh, Nice. Yeah. I don't know if I've so, ever had an acronym for one of my jobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, it's yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm, it's called the position is called a BRS. So the schools here in the Madison School, the uh, Madison School District have that position in, in every school. Okay. There's a few. It depends on the lang- on the communities and the languages that what what type of community what groups go to that school. For example, in my school there was a Mandinka BRS because there were communities from Gambia, for example. Okay. And when you do that, uh, like what do you just teach in other classes but you have the ability or like what what is like what do you actually teach the kids aside from language? Yeah, I I work with um I'm kind of a bridge between the the parents and the school oh, okay. system and the teachers. So I make calls, I translate documents, I interpret for for meetings, and also I support children uh, whose um, first language might be, in this case, Spanish. So I help them uh, in the classroom as well. Okay. We do a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly, <laughs> I know yes. that's that's nice. And, but you're also being an artist too. Are you also involved with the art program in the school system? Um, not, no, I'm not. I haven't. I, I, we just made like a few weeks ago. We started an art club, a virtual art club for you the did. students. Okay. Yeah. So I co-hosted with another teacher, but I'm not the art teacher at, at the school. Okay. What? Who, how is the? Uh, how's the virtual? Art pro or uh, art club going? I guess. Good. I mean, there, there. We just started, so just learning how to. We've been learning how to draw simple things or characters. Uh-huh. So maybe next week we'll learn how to. I think they wanted to learn how to draw Sonic. <laughs> right. I, that's of course. That's that's the first thing you want to do. It's like instantly. Yeah. It's like I want to draw comic characters or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's how I I learned. Uh huh. I drew, I remember drawing a lot of anime. Yeah. So I come from the city, the city of Guadalajara, which Guillermo del Toro is from. Okay. So, and in his interviews, uh, he was talking about how uh, someone decided in our city and also in Mexico, but in our city to... The TV programs were a lot of Japanese programming. That kind of uh, influenced our own ex- uh, aesthetics in a way. Yeah. Because that's what we, how we learned how to, that's what we wanted to learn to draw, like learn how to draw that. Uh-huh. So, I mean, I was, I, I influenced a lot with Japanese anime and manga and this whole, um, well, the way the way the characters are drawn, right? At, at some point, I I used to draw that way, okay. and a lot of my art, uh, like uh, at art school, a lot of the my classmates also used to draw that way. Yeah, it's it, it, it very very much happens that way. It's like the kids will there'll be one popular thing, and all of a sudden, all the kids are drawing it. And at my school, it was. Uh, it was like Hanna Barbera characters, but I want to say I remember when I was much younger, there was a station here. Well, um, actually, I think it was like TBS. It was it was definitely a national station, um, but they had a lot of stuff. I didn't realize that it was it was anime and like different types of live action Japanese TV shows that they were playing here. There was like uh, Space Giants, which was about these this giant robot family, but it was live action. And yeah. then there was uh, Battle of the Planets and things like that. And, and I always thought it was super cool. But growing up, I had no idea that it was imported. I just thought it was it was just a show on TV. Were you aware of the like, were you aware of what the background of what you were watching was? Yeah, because sometimes they would dub the the like the, the songs at the end. And sometimes they wouldn't. Oh, really? So we oh, would have so cool. the Japanese version. Okay. Of, of the songs, so yeah, we knew, we knew, and like it was all over TV all day. I mean, we watched you uh, like American cartoons as well, mm-hmm. but the big bulk of it was Japanese. Okay. Yeah. Around what age did you start drawing when you were doing this? Around, I would say seven. Okay. Seven, eight. Yeah, okay. I used to draw a lot of characters. I guess I wanted to become an animator at, at like a very early age. Really? 
Yeah. Did you ever go into that at all or did you ever try? <laughs> no, but it's something maybe in the future I might experiment with. Okay. Yeah. In, in case this whole painting thing doesn't pan out is what you're saying. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 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 oh man. And but you also so you you were you had started out with an influence in anime and, and stuff like that, but you also now you're doing painting and mixed media. So how do you actually go from I want to be an animator and do anime but become a painter and a mixed media artist? Like what was your first foray into that sort of realm that actually you kept up with? Well, I guess a lot of it started because um, when we, when we lived in Los Angeles, my dad was, he, he used to take us to garage sales, mm -hmm. like every weekend. I'm listening. And, uh, yeah. I some garage sales. <laughs> and, uh, I know, I've seen your post. <laughs> and he would buy, like, things from, like, his I don't know. He, I mean, he was open to buying things that looked weird mm -hmm. or things that came from other countries or just things that he found interesting. And so my house was like, we would see different influences all over. Okay. And I guess that somehow, uh, because there were sometimes materials, um, that they he kept a lot of things he wasn't a hoarder but he kept a lot of things around so i remember like the first time i collaged i had found his stamp collection uh -huh. somehow and i decided to make a collage with them and i remember that that was the first time and i hid it underneath the towels which was the worst idea because they sh my mom found it like that same day yeah but i remember like the experience of like collaging okay so ever since then i mean i've been interested in like using different material to collage yeah. which is what i still do to this point yeah it, it, the funny thing is is when you're telling that story now this is also why i wanted to ask you about mixed media because there's a very similar background there. I also collect things. I collect them because I love these types of objects and I think they're neat. And one thing I'm trying to do to not be a hoarder is to, <laughs> is to try and, uh, th that's why I've been, well, I sell them also to make money, but I sell them. So I stop putting so much value and attachment on them. They're just neat mm -hmm. to have. They'll be here forever, but, and I'll forget all about them. But when finally something happens to them or, uh, I run across them and my wife is like, Oh, we, can we just throw this out? And I'm like, no, no, yeah. you know, it's like, that's super cool. I love it. And she, she's like, you didn't know it was there. And when you said you, you found a stamp collection and made a collage, inst collage, I was like instantly, oh no, you use the stamps, you know? <laughs> yes. And that's, that's my most difficult thing. Like, how do you come up with ideas for you? I have the hardest time. I have a closet full of stuff that's even, mm -hmm. I can't sell because they're either broken or they're missing pieces. And they're all super cool. They have like cool artwork on them and I want to use them. But I can't think of what to do with them, let alone go, well, I could cut this. No, I can't cut that. Like I, I literally can't yeah. touch them. How do you come up with these ideas and how do you, uh, how do you use the stuff that you find? Well, right now it's easier. My brother is a historian. So every time I, I have an idea of how to use the material. He's like, no, don't not. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> this is so-and-so. Okay, was so made far everybody's so on my side. All right, okay. <laughs> but I usually uh, have in mind some, some scraps of paper or some interesting parts that I think they might be symbolic in a way. So I, I usually start with the backgrounds, and I – kind of choose some of like important piece important mixes that might create some some met meta metaphor in a way mm -hmm. or some symbolism um, and then other pieces I just keep on adding and that kind of goes with the with the flow it's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle in a way okay all so the edges but I don't know how I like some some of the middle parts are 
it's going to take some some time and that that's go that goes with the flow it's not like i choose all all the pieces that i'm going to collage at at, at first i know some some artists do okay uh that has never worked with me you mean you you kind of do it as you go along and it just I do kinda, it yes really ah that's so frustrating you're just one of those people that just naturally knows how to do it <laughs> 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 but the, the 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 hard part is to know when to stop, uh -huh. because ki ki that's kind of kind of the trick. And kind of at some point, at some point when I'm working, I need to like take a break, and then revisit it the next day, and then decide if it if it needs more. I mean, I'm kind of a maximalism, mm -hmm. I'm maximalist in a way. So I I need to like take a moment and then come back to the to the piece that makes sense do you work on several yeah. pieces at a time or do you focus on just one i usually focus on one it depends on if i have a date that i need to complete a cer certain amount of pieces that usually helps it helps a lot of artists when you have like you need to finish a certain amount of pieces for this date so that makes you I guess, I mean, it, it, for me, it helps. Otherwise, I'll stay in a piece for a long time. What was the, like, what's the date that you have set? Are you saying that you have a showing and you're literally making new pieces for it? Right now, I, I'm not, okay. which is why I'm, like, taking more time. Then I take more time with the piece. But you have done that. You've actually... Yes. Really? I don't know if I've ever, I mean, I guess I've never thought to ask that if people uh, prepare pieces specifically for a show. Huh. Yes, a lot of people do. Okay, yeah. I guess and, that's and, never and occurred to me. Of, I don't know why. A lot of people work better under pressure. Okay. And I'm, I'm one of them. <laughs> otherwise, I will, which is necessary as well, but otherwise I'll just stay on a piece for more time. Yeah. And um, well, and you saying... Um, knowing when to stop and all that. I mean, that's, I, I get that too. I know exactly what you mean. And it's uh, interesting because the difference of the mediums, I mean, using mixed medium, the difference of the things that you're using, like you're applying what paint and then different objects and all that to the, like, that's gotta be even more hard because it's like, well, what if I added, I mean, if you're painting, then you stop painting. It's like, oh, but I could just put something on there. It, yeah. and, and that's different than like going, I can keep painting this one area or I can put something on it. Um, and the, also, I'd like to ask, uh, ask about the color palette. So you use a really colorful color palette, but at the same time, it's also kind of a dark, colorful color palette, if that makes any sense. Like, yes. How, tell me about the, the color technique that you use. Well, I mean, the whole themes and color palette that I'm using now has it's, it's shifted uh, what I paint now in Madison has changed what I painted back in in Guadalajara okay uh, a lot of the colors that I'm using now uh, reference Mexican folk art in a way and but sometimes they're a little bit darker a lot of the the colors uh, also like reference traditional handicraft crafts and traditional Mexican crafts, okay. which are like very bright, vibrant colors. And that's why I'm using those, those colors at the moment. Okay. And what, what kind of paint do you use? Uh, it's mixed media oil, acrylic oil. Acrylic. Yeah, no, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. And who would you say are, uh, with more of the recent work that you do, do you have any direct influences that kind of led you in this direction? Oh God. Um, I mean, obviously I, I come from uh, a city where like the main, the most important artist is uh, Orozco, one of the three great muralists of, of Mexico. He's influenced my work as well. Uh, Right now, it's it's kind of a mixture. Okay. I can't say like one specific artist that I'm influenced by at the moment. Mm, I, I love uh, Posadas. He uh, he kind of created all of that imagery of Day of the Dead. So oh, really, I didn't know that. 
because I reference a lot of Day of the Dead and the celebration, I obviously take elements from him. So he is part. He is part. I, I, I take a lot of... I'm more influenced right now by like traditional folk art. And actually, because of the pandemic, I've been able to to take some workshops online from from oh. the people that do these crafts and it's been it's been great because otherwise it's not something that you could find easily and how they make these objects so it's been a great learning experience and um, I mean this kind of traditions that it's passed on from generations to generation yeah and some of the artisans have been willing to share like how their process and the stories of where where everything comes from uh i've been i took a course on uh like a little workshop on how to make uh you remember the movie coco like um uh, there's these magical animals called alebrijes i don't know it sounds familiar yeah so that's kind of a mixture like a fantastical animal a mix of different animals okay but that's that's part of of mexican uh folk art so they're actually made of um cardboard and sometimes wood and so an artist was able to share like how he does it from from scratch and that that's that's something that's uh that's really enlightened me to like to to understand the process and just uh value everything all of those things that we take for granted because i was used to like looking at all of that all the time yeah and uh but never really questioned like where where it all comes from and how it's made never yeah never saw the process it was just something no. that was available yes huh and, and this was on the uh this was on that virtual class that you're talking about yeah but a lot of the artisans have been opening uh you know, virtual workshops so because people have been asking and right. also because they haven't been selling a lot because of tourism has gone down. Based. And mm -hmm. is there any, I, I'm curious, like with this, like the folk art one that you're talking about, sounds like it would have had a lot of people in it. And when you do this, is it just, are you observing it? And there's a chat room. Is it like tiled videos of everybody in the room? Like, I guess, how is it set up? Well, usually, and I just took, I mean, I took one yesterday for oh. a, a different street artist that was doing stenciling. Oh, cool. Uh, um, so usually it's done through Zoom, and the artist has a, has a, someone is filming him doing the process. Usually they take uh, from two to a week and how to, the whole process, two hours, where where they're explaining everything and people are chatting, asking questions. Also through Zoom, I mean, they unmute themselves and ask questions. Okay, so, so it is like it, tiled video. Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh wow! But it's been great. the uh, The one I took yesterday was from an artist. He's a street artist. His name is Nasa. He's okay. from Argentina. Uh, he does these uh, stencils. Uh, like big stencils on on walls so he was explaining all the process through it and there was people from from Argentina, Colombia, Ecuador, Mexico, um Canada. I okay. mean it, it's it's been a great experience and something that I hope stays after the pandemic is kind of these platforms to share to share ideas. I agree. I like I like I've always actually before this all happened I've been a huge uh supporter of online things being available all basically everywhere and to everyone. And now that we've all, get, but a lot of it is that people would think it was too hard or it would take up too much time. And now that we've all had to interact with it, it's just something yep. that we know about now. And we're like, Oh, that's how you did it. And it's like, sure. It's still, it's still an annoyance to set up, but it's like, it's not as hard as you think it's, it's the, yeah, it's the putting it in your mind and it grows and grows into this bigger thing that you have to deal with. It, it, that was the problem. And, now it's just, yeah, now it's uh, as easy as like, I'll just turn on my phone and do it, you know? <laughs> yeah. It, no, it can be it that is. simple. Um, so I, I do hope it stays around too, because I think it offers a lot of value to many people. And also, even after it's over, there's still 
rural places that don't have access to different galleries or different artists. And now they do through this type of stuff. And if it dries up, then that dries up too for those people who are finding this influence. I mean, you, you said stencil artist in Argentina, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's, that's not something that would have just popped up here, you know? <laughs> no, no. And, and, and it, and I've been really lucky to be able to, to come to, to take these workshops. And I wouldn't thought I like maybe two years ago, like, like, I don't think I would have to like travel or, right. I mean, it would be difficult to take, to learn about, about the process of these artists. So it's been, it's been good. Granted, it would be neat to travel to go see it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not denying that part of it. Yes. Actually going to see it in person would be much more fun. Um, th so you watch this large stencil making process is there something like, is this something you would like to do or something, or were you just curious about how it worked? I'd like to know if you're going to be making some giant <laughs> stencils sometime soon. I've been curious about it. Uh, I also took another workshop with another stencil artist. His okay. name is Himed from Mexico. And um, I've been, I've been uh, thinking about the idea of maybe making uh, stencils or, kind of or even wheat pasting them or I don't know at some point okay right now I'm taking a, a dama the Dane arts mural program oh, okay yeah it, uh, invited several artists uh, to learn about their process hmm. so it's something on my mind but I'm still learning because I mean there's this, this whole boom with street art Mm -hmm. And it's everywhere, but are you? I think you really need to take the time to learn to learn about it, and to know what you're getting into because it's not as easy if you want to create something that is that is well worth, you know. Yeah. Uh, and they're not. I mean, it's 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 a whole different thing that that what I've been doing on my own work. The process is completely different. So yeah, I'm learning. Okay, and. I was curious too, if you had been working with stencils, because there's some pattern work that you do in, I mean, your stuff is very intricate to begin with. And let's put it this way. Your artwork is what I wanted to be when I was starting out as an artist, but I realized like, I'm never going to be able, like my stuff just, I could never get it to look that way. I, I love your style. And I always wanted to be that, but I had to accept that I'm never going to be able to pull off that style. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I'm a little, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of just really in awe of a lot of your work because I'm just like, Oh, I want to make that so bad. <laughs> um, but you also have along with that intricate work that you do, there's a lot of um, patterns and stuff that you put in there and I've never been good at patterns and you just have such a steady hand. You look like you have such patience for it. So how do you do a lot, a lot of those patterns? It depends. I mean, I mix. Some of them is a, they are stencils, okay, uh, replicating kind of traditional tile work in Mexico, or textiles. So I try to reproduce that onto like the the collage effect. Uh, some of them are painted, so it's it's kind of a mix. Okay. All right. Yeah. This, yeah. I, I saw the piece that you did at the Goodman Center, and it's like the three tiered piece. Oh, yeah. And, and it has all those nice little patterns on it. And, uh, uh, oh, it, it, and that's the other thing too, is you, you're able to put so much on along with the mixed media, like put so much on the canvas, but yet at the same time, it all kind of works together. Like it doesn't seem like you just put everything on the canvas. It, it's, there's still lots of space, but there's yes. not. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm very, I'm, I, I love that you're able to pull that off. Like what, what's, when you first started doing it, it had to be something that you got better at. Like, um, when did you start adding more objects to what you make? I think, I think this, like the, the technique of this, like mixed media collage, I think I started around, I'd say a little bit over 10 years ago. Okay. And the 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 first pieces were really collaged, <laughs> okay. like really uh, no space. Uh, it was 
like completely covered, but they were like maybe they were the first pieces I did. They of were course. kind of experimental, and then I kind it, it it all ha- had to do with the with the theme. One I once I had like a a topic that I wanted to work with, then it kind the the technique then was was there to aid me to help me uh, with the symbolism, and then that's when I think it uh, it, it just made sense. Okay. How do you come up with the topics? Like I'm looking at that piece behind you right now that has like sort of a a cat with lots of eyes sort of thing. Like so, you were just like, I'm going to do cat. <laughs> well, um, I just had a show at Latino Art Sync in Milwaukee. Okay. And we had programmed that show in, I think it was February of last year. Mm-hmm. Just before everything shut down, so by then I was starting on the topic of maybe incorporating masks, actually, because I was, I've been this is like a little miniature. Oh, that's so cool! I love yeah, it. so these are these are these masks. Masks are from um, a town, Citlala in Guerrero. So they're they're called tiger masks. I started kind of reading. Uh, a lot about the mass in traditional folk art and the the symbolism around them. And then this whole pandemic started and the concept of mask, and I mean, it was starting to be kind of discussed also. Mm-hmm. So it was interesting. My work has, uh, is, has shifted. The, the, the themes have shifted from when I was living in Mexico and what I do here. I think... Uh, there was when I moved here. There was a questioning about my own identity hmm. uh, as a as a Latina artist, as a as a Latina, mm-hmm. um, that I didn't have when I was in Mexico. Because when you come here, uh, you start to <laughs> to encounter all of these like labels, labeling and grouping and uh, and also understanding because I work at a school so kind of understanding uh, the children that that are living here and how they grow grow up in kind of this two two cultures in between two cultures but they're not from their their they don't live they're not from Mexico with the and I'm talking about Mexico just just because I'm Mexican, but they they're what we say in, in Spanish, ni de aquí ni de allá. They're not from there, but they're neither from here. So it's like a different culture as well. Yeah. And and when I came and I'm also Mexican American, but I grew up in Mexico. So when I came here, I guess uh, I kind of was confronted again with my own identity and where I came from. So my themes changed. That's why I started uh, kind of painting about my own culture and all those layerings, all those layers that my own culture has because uh, we're made up of different things. So, And the technique of the collage just kind of worked in that sense because I talk about these layers all the time. Yeah. And this was not something that you had realized in your work before the pandemic? Oh, I started kind of painting about my own culture when I came to Madison. Okay. But it it, it was it, it kind of this new series is kind of um brought it all together in a yeah. in a way. Yeah. And what is the do you have a name for the series or and you said this was this showed in Milwaukee just recently. You said right. Yes, this show was in Milwaukee. It's called. It was called uh, Los Rostros Ocultos, the Hidden Faces. Huh. So a lot of the pieces in, in the show had this layering of the collage, and also there was layering in the background. A lot of the layering in the background uh, was a brands. Some of the pieces had like this mixture of brands that were both from the United States and from Mexico. Okay. 
and kind of playing with that idea of in living in two cultures. Hmm. And also, uh, I lived in Mexico when NAFTA happened. Okay. The trade agreement. So I saw the change uh, that happened after that. And it, I mean, it, it's, it was interesting. It was interesting because at first, everyone, all the big companies, all the franchises started to come to Mexico. And everyone was excited and went to all. I remember like the first McDonald's in my city. There were lines, yeah, lines to get to 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 get there, um, but there was also something happened that we also didn't want to purchase our own products, mm. the ones that were made in Mexico, and we have a term for it, which is malinchismo. So when the trade agreement started, there was a lot of this like wanting to buy like the international brands, the American brands. Okay. And and that happened for a long time. I think things are changing now that people uh want to buy or want to want to have products that are made in the country. So it kind of shifted. That's that's an interesting point that didn't occur to me. And a, a, something I'd like to ask too is, and this is just a weird observation. You had mentioned you were using brands in the background. I find yes. it so interesting that in art, a lot of the time you can do such a thing like that. Like it's, I guess it's considered fair use um, or, you know, just because you're using it to express an opinion. But like if you were to do a song and like use a jingle from a company or, you know, use something musically, you would get, taken down or get like a copyright strike or something like that. So I find, and when you put those in there, my first thought was to think as a musician and go like, Oh, how are you allowed to use that? And it's like, no, you are allowed to use that. And that, that thought just popped into my head. Have you ever, have you ever uh, had any problems with using like actual branded material in your work? Well, I try because they're in the background and because I use this all um, layering, so they're not completely visible. So they're like be just a, a a part of the of the logos, for yeah. example. But you would know what I'm referring. Right. So I I try to do that. <laughs> but so so you're saying no, no big corporation has come after you for your no, artwork, no is what you're saying. No big corporation so far. <laughs> well, good, and I hope they don't. It's just it was just an interesting thought that popped in my head, and I was curious. And I know that it's probably okay. I mean, the whole thing, uh, Andy Warhol using the, I mean, just the quick example off the top of my head, you know, using the Campbell Soup ad or the um, the Brillo or whatever the heck else he was doing screen prints of, and I mean, those were famous, and he's actually using branded material. Um, uh, the other thing too, so we said that you, uh, you had shown this in Milwaukee and with your stuff, it's all, it's all fairly yeah. large and you have a lot of things and you're saying you're creating things specifically for showings. How do you, how do you move your stuff to these galleries? I guess I've never really thought about actually packaging up artwork and moving it somewhere. So how are you going about that? Well, my paintings are not that big. Uh, they're medium format. They're than mine. Usually. <laughs> I don't have any. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but they, we managed to fit it in the, in my boyfriend's car. So, but this new series that I, I'm work, uh, I'm starting to work on. Those are going to be larger pieces, and. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you have to still prepare them. I mean, you've got like other objects that you, you don't just like open the door and chuck the pieces in there, right? I mean, you you've no. you clearly pack them up. So, I mean, is there some sort of method to packing up large pieces of artwork or like what do you do? I don't have that much. I know people like are like obsessive with with the material and they buy these special bags and yeah and that are so expensive. No, I I mean I wrap them with bu bubble bubble uh okay. plastic. All right. It's yeah. That's so you you think about it the way I kind of do too when I have to move things it's like I'm sure it'll be fine it it won't it'll shift I'll just drive carefully. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> 
Now, as far as uh, getting these gallery, uh, your stuff into galleries, how are you finding, how do you, do you contact these galleries? Do you have like a place you go to find them? Do they find you? Like, how are you getting these shows? Uh, so far, they have found me. Really? Oh, yes. man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so right now, uh, I was invited to the uh, show at the Trout, Muse Trout Museum of Art. I Napleton. know. That's that interactive one. I just saw that. Yes, it is great. So it was curated by Tiana Bui, and uh, I was luckily invited to, to be part of the show. Yeah. So, and the good thing is that you could go online and um, there's you can watch the show virtual, virtually. Yeah. So it reminds me of these old uh, CD-ROM games that you used to be able to do, <laughs> where you walk around like it reminds me <laughs> exactly. of playing Myst. Like yes. I, I used to love that game, and I'm what because because it's not something. I mean, I I know there are like first person shooter games where you walk around, but it's like no, this is one where like it's just kind of calm, and you go and you look yeah. around and like see if you can. Like I keep expecting there to be like what's this? Someone you push out. A, or yeah, or there's there's a button you push, and all of a sudden there's this door that opens, and you walk into like you know a clouded city or something. You know, yeah. It's, it's, so I've literally done things like walked around and like tried to enter the bathroom and gone up the stairs in the fire escape. And so I'm looking to see where the, the Easter egg is, but um, no, it's, that's really cool. It, it, so how, how do you, did you have to prepare anything for that? Did, was there any, like, how does that whole thing get set up or do you have any idea? No, I, I just took the pieces, but those pieces were the ones that were at the Latino Arts Inc. Okay. Uh, show. So I just took those pieces there. Okay. And yeah. where, where is this actual virtual gallery located? It's the Trout Museum of Art. It's in Appleton, Appleton Wisconsin. Okay. That that was yeah. the thing I didn't, I, I, I was so fascinated with going around the gallery. I realized when I was done, I was like, oh, I don't know where I just was. So, <laughs> yeah. So it's in Appleton. Wow. That's pretty progressive for Appleton. I like it. Yeah, it's a great place. For some reason, I thought it would have been like in New York or Chicago or something. But no, look no. at that. Yeah. Wisconsin doing good. <laughs> I like it. I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so and it, in uh, September, I'll be the uh, Emoca is going to have a show on. I think they're calling it Mexican Modernist. It's it's they're taking their print collection and pairing it with a local uh, Mexican Mexican uh, Mexican American artists okay um, so that will be in September nice yeah. and is that that's gonna be in person that's when we're all hoping that we're gonna <laughs> be vaccinated hopefully, hopefully yes yes <laughs> you don't know if they're gonna be doing an, uh, a virtual component like the Appleton Museum did uh, but they might I mean I would hope they would I I, I mean I I guess they're I, I guess they're like um, looking for what other, I guess what other museums have, have done during the pandemic and yeah. then what has worked for them. So that might be an option. Yeah. I think a lot of people that during this time haven't been able to go to galleries and museums has found that, uh, that option. And I think they, they've been accessing shows that way. Yeah. Yeah. Well and speaking of adapting, like a lot of your stuff being in galleries and mainly that, I, I, I mean, I'm assuming that's mainly what your, your artistic, you know, venture in the world was, was, was galleries, correct? Uh, yes. Okay. It, it, so how have you adapted with the whole shutdown and everything? Like what have you learned or what have you experienced or what, what new things were you finally able to accomplish artistically for yourself? during this whole shutdown? Well, during the shutdown, I still needed to produce uh, yeah. the pieces for the show. show. So I was quite, it was normal, normal time for me being inside <laughs> the studio. So, so this was just everybody <laughs> shut down with you is yeah, what it amounted everybody to. Everybody shut down with me, exactly. <laughs> but the the component that maybe I, I spend more time is and um, kind of getting, um, this whole website and having an option also for prints yeah. uh, for people that might be interesting. And so that's something that I started recently about two, 
two months, two about two months ago. Really? And the idea to offer some of some of my work as print. So that's something that came about because of of the times. Yeah. So it's I, it's been it's been good. I had talked to a couple of other artists who were considering uh, making prints. Where are you getting? How are you getting yours created? Uh, there's a website called Gicle Today. Okay. So I've been doing it through them. Okay. Yeah. It's fairly reasonable. Is it easy to do? Like, I guess, what is it? It's what is easy, the process? Yeah. Okay. It's easy to do. And it's, the prices are, are okay. Uh, yeah, sometimes that's the way they it is with any very, online printing. Very, very, very pricey. And I just want to offer something for, for people that want to have something of mine. One thing I noticed is your website is you you've been working on your website very well. It's very yeah. thorough. Like I'm I'm impressed. Like that's Thank you. I need to go through mine and start going through it again because yours is very well organized and I like it. So Thank good you. job there. And on the uh also on top of that, like how do you promote yourself online? Have you been doing anything to promote yourself? I mean, you say people are coming to you for the galleries, so somehow they're hearing about you. You know, so how are you promoting yourself? <laughs> Uh, I've been trying to be like posting on on Instagram a little bit more and sharing about my process and uh, the pieces that I have finished or trying trying to to show more about what I do and I think uh, it's been it's been pretty positive and I've gotten opportunities through through the social media that I didn't think there was a some time that I I would never never share anything about my work on on social media so it's something that mm -hmm. I've changed and it, and mostly because also the pandemic uh, has forced me to to reach out or at least uh, kind of share what I'm doing otherwise I'll just be here in my studio <laughs> right yeah, it's a tough it's a tough shift to make. It's uh, putting stuff out there or even going I'm going to do this or I'm working on this and showing that part of it and not being done with it. That's a that's a hard thing to get over, but at the same time, people only see it for a second a lot of the time. And the it'll register later on when you show the piece or at least what I've learned like when I'm doing something and it's like I show I'm working on this and then I actually show the thing and I feel like it does better when I post the finished piece because people are familiar with that it was coming. I don't know. It's yeah. It's just getting over that like who cares? You know, like <laughs> do you want <laughs> do you want to do this stuff then do it. You know, that's 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 kind of where it took me a while um to do that. It, and yeah. It, it it definitely helped. So I'm glad to hear that that you're I mean, that's how I found out about your stuff and then I yeah. contacted you because you posted something. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. I wanted to contact her. <laughs> so your stuff just happened to show up in my feed at the right time when I was looking for a few more guests to have on the show. So yeah, so that's what's been happening so far. Yeah. Social media. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, what kind of uh, plans do you have coming up in the future? Uh, I know you said you had the gallery that you're, you're going to be doing this. Did you say this summer or this fall? I can't remember. Uh, I will be this fall. Uh, okay. Yes, having some pieces at Emoka, and uh, otherwise, I'm starting a new series, and uh, it's about food. Is it? <laughs> yeah. Why? <laughs> oh God. Um, oh wait, is this the one? I saw a painting that you did that was of a person. Um, standing in an apron by a lot of like baked baked goods, and then someone sitting in the background on the couch. Is that part of that series, oh, or is no, that a different that's, thing? That's a very old series. Okay. Uh, that I that's part of a series that I did in 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 Mexico. Okay. But this new series is it, it kind of also touching back to my culture and the importance of of food in in my culture. And the symbolism through it. Um, so I'm kind of a uh, working and having ideas. It's still, it's still, there's still nothing. Okay. <laughs> but that's going to be kind of the focus. So 
I'll okay. be working through that. I I hopefully I can travel again. Yeah. Uh, I I want to go to uh, Oaxaca. Uh, a lot of the uh, there's like interesting food food culture in Oaxaca that is different from. Uh, I don't know where cuisine. that is. Where is Oaxaca? Cuisine is is uh, is very different in depending on the on the region of Mexico. It's near. Guatemala. So I'm hoping to. I, w I won a grant this last year. You so, did? yes, um, the Forward Art Prize, oh, which okay. is a, uh, a grant uh, mainly focused on women artists. So I was, I was luckily one of the the winners this year, along with Adriana Barrios, and uh, so hope and it's it. It came at the right, right moment where I just needed uh, funding to like uh, to create, yeah. basically. And um, it's been a great experience. Uh, I've also gotten a lot of feedback from it. A lot of people uh, got to know my work um, from it. So. And I'm at this point where I'm just trying to professionalize my craft as well. Well, so. I don't think you have far to go in that category <laughs> because I love your stuff is amazing. So, Thank you. <laughs> and uh, if people wanted to check out some of your work, where would you suggest that they go do that? Yes, uh, my website is angelicacontreras.net, and that's my main website. Or you can on Instagram. I'm uh, <laughs> my username is. Senorita Galleta, S E N O R I T A G A L L E T A. Um, that used to be my uh, <laughs> alias when I was in Mexico. So okay, it's still it's still my. I haven't changed it. Well, it's because that's a whole process, and then you have to tell people to go over here instead. You don't know who sees it. Yeah, I but if that. you look at if you look. Uh, uh, my name up at Angel Angelica Contreras. You will find my Instagram. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. I'm glad I got to yep. meet you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>